Okay, welcome to a special episode of Coffee with Chuck. It's a live Friday edition, and I'm really excited to have Dan Holiday with us. A lot of us don't know what we want to do, uh, and some of us may still not know what we want to do, even into adulthood. But Dan, from an early age, really had a passion and followed that and has had an amazing career. And I just, I, I've known Dan for a long time. Actually, my first job out of college was in radio, and Dan Holliday was a well known radio personality in Wichita as a young man. I think he started when he was like eight years old. But he's, <laughs> he's, uh, he's going to tell us about his passion, how he worked to get where he wanted to be. And uh, Dan, first of all, thank you for joining us. We know you're very busy. And uh, it's really exciting to have you here to, to share your story. Well, thanks. Thanks, Chuck. And I, I really, I'm honored to, to be here with you guys today and, and to, uh, to kind of tell a little bit about how this all happened. Can everyone hear me okay? Give a thumbs up. Thumbs up? Okay, good. Right. I just want to make sure, make sure you can hear okay. Um, you're exactly right. I, I don't know when it was, but um, I, I think all of us at some age, maybe five, six years old, have that dream of what we want to do. And maybe it doesn't always materialize. It, it could be a, a firefighter or, um, you know, maybe you want to be a pilot, or something like that. But, but for me, there was a fascination um, growing up on a farm in, uh, in, in Butler County. Uh, I always wanted, to, always wanted to find out a little bit more about how weather worked. Um, because you were always surrounded by the extremes and weather growing up and living on a farm. It's how the, the farm uh, survived. And, and then there was also um, this fascination with radio and, and our local radio station, which was um, in just outside of El Dorado, Kansas, was what I would listen to all the time and think, you know, I'd, I'd love to be able to work there and do that and wound up building a sort of a pretend radio station in my bedroom where I would practice uh, from the time I was five to whenever. First applied there at 12. I think they probably laughed at me because of the child labor law at that time. But um, finally, at about 15 or 16, I, I applied for a job there again. And they said, you know, they, I, we just don't have a place for you. And I said, oh, I'll work for free. I'll do anything. And that was where I got, got a shot. And so um, my story is really like a lot of people who for whatever reason, you, if you have some sort of burning passion early on and you're able to do something you love and then eventually be able to make a living at it, it, it truly is a blessing. And, and, and that's, that's the way I feel about that. Since that time, um, I've been in radio since 16 in some form. And in about 2004, well, I, I should go back a little bit. Um, from that time of 17 till 2004, I worked in Wichita primarily and then got an opportunity to come to Kansas City. It was during that time uh, I saw a real change in the industry. Um, we were seeing the, the internet um, really, really become more diverse in terms of having different ways to get audio. And, and I remember buying a book in about 2004 on podcasting and thinking, man, this looks really fascinating. But at the time, you know, we didn't have the smartphones and the ability to download the way that anybody could get audio that we do today. And so um, it, it's, it's sort of been, um, at, at 2004, it was sort of a transition from how long is, is radio as we know it, with a, with a tower and with a DJ and with all that kind of uh, setup, going to continue to last because we saw um, the internet take on a whole new um, I guess a whole new form and, and sort of in a way compete with radio. It, it, it took away uh, the limitations of just having a broadcast tower and you could hear anything you wanted anywhere in the world. And when that became the case, I thought I'm gonna go back to a school to learn more about weather. And then maybe there's some way to marry these two things and, and do weather on radio or somehow have it you know, involved in the internet over time. Um, and so once I finished, um, started seeing the, the writing on the wall. There had been three major uh, cutbacks at the radio station I worked at, and, and I kept surviving these cutbacks. More and more DJs were losing their jobs. 
because it, it you know, it, it didn't make the money that it once made. And uh, there was just uh, uh, sort of a new focus on the internet and where it was going. So um, with that being said, I decided maybe it's time to start a business and doing this just part time and see where it goes. And by 2011, it had, it had gotten to a point where I was doing weather forecast and severe weather coverage on radio stations, um, not only in the Midwest, but around the country, and decided that maybe it's time to take the leap and, and really focus on this full time while still providing it to, to, to radio stations. Well, by this time, there had been more cutbacks in, in the radio business, and at times there were not even any human beings in the studio. And so they needed a service where we provided information sent by the internet into their automation systems and out over the air without anybody uh, having to, to, touch, to touch it. So, um, and, that, and that's really where we are today. Now in 2020, um, we do weather. I work with about four or five other um, colleagues and together we provide uh, weather forecasts for radio stations uh, all over the country. We're on just over 300 different stations. And it's, uh, I just got done doing the weather in, in a station in Sacramento, California. And just before that one in Hilton Head, South Carolina. So it's, it's from one spectrum of the country to another. So that in a nutshell is, is, is sort of the beginning and where we are now. And any other questions you have, uh, I'd be happy to, happy to answer. Dan, I'd like to dig in a little bit deeper on your resume, and and certainly the radio industry has changed. It was, and, and I'm a child of the 80s, certainly. I uh, graduated from high school in 84. When I was at college, uh, you were working in Wichita. So you, you got your start at KOYY as a what, 15, 16 year old. When did you make the jump? Because moving from El Dorado to Wichita is a pretty big jump for a radio personality. Can you go through that process and and how you were able to go from KOYY and El Dorado to uh, Wichita, one of the major Wichita radio stations? I think I, I think for all of us, and I, I can say this for anyone watching and listening today. Um, no matter what, if you, if you find a passion that you're doing and you, you fall in love with and you work hard at it and, and people see that you're working hard at it, uh, everybody needs someone to believe in you. And, and, and if there's someone to believe in you and watch what you're doing because you work hard and, and you show that it's what you love doing, uh, someone will take note and they'll, and, and they'll help out. Uh, there was a guy named uh, Scott Michaels who worked in, in, in radio for Wichita for, in, in, for years. And um, he walked in one day and, and he had this, uh, this voice almost like, you know, like Humphrey Bogart, like a Hollywood star. And he'd say, Danny, I think it's time. I think it's time you move on out of here. And I said, why? I, I love it here. He says, you should try going on in Wichita. And I said, I don't know anybody at a radio station in Wichita. And he said, I do. Let me make a call. And he said, I'll see if I can get you on over there. And you might be able to still stay here. He called uh, Jack Oliver, who at that time ran KKRD uh, in Wichita, which is a big, you know, pop music station. It was, it was not only big in Wichita, but it was respected nationally. And it's what everybody um, our age in high school, in college, were, were listening to. And so, uh, so Jack called one day in the afternoon, and I just, I can hear his voice now. And he said, Dan... How do you like to come over and have some fun? You'll work 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. It'll be a wonderful time. And that's exactly what he said. And I thought, 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. And I said, how, how often? And he said, Friday nights, that's all you get for now. You know, it was just this really high voice. And I was like, wow, I've heard this guy on the radio. And, and he just called and he's going to give me four hours a week to work in the middle of the night. And um, I said, when do I start? And he said, Friday and I said well how, how do I how do I learn what to do and he said just show up it'll be fun and that was that was the way he ran the radio station so lighthearted, and I and I just that that's how the that's how it happened but it was somebody believing and then somebody making a call to help to help out that's kind of how that transition happened and then you were in Wichita 
for how many years? And I know multiple stations, but you were really a fixture. There, there were, you know, the, the Tim Peters and the, the Don Halls and, and, uh, you know, but you were, you were there too. I mean, you were one of the, the, the mainstays of Wichita radio. Can you tell us a little bit about, I mean, obviously your talent, uh, was critical in, in your success, but can you tell us a little bit about radio in those days and, and how you were able to, uh, stay, a, uh, a primary part of, of Wichita radio. And then from that point, I know you're a uh, music director, program director, perhaps at Kisson, and, and then you made the move to Kansas City. Can you tell us how that all transpired? Sure, sure. Um, so I, I th that's, that's a great question because writing out the, the longevity of, of, of a changing industry is, is important. And, and I'll be completely honest. I mean, there, there wasn't a lot of money. I remember making maybe $3.50 an hour at KKRD, driving from El Dorado to Wichita for four hours a week. And you add that up and it doesn't cover the cost of gas. But as, as Jack Oliver once told me, there are times you have to invest in yourself. And, and when you invest in yourself, it may mean taking a loss in the long run, and you may drive over there really for free when you when you do that. But but that was the beginning stage. Um, about a year and a half after being there, um, there was a legendary DJ Tim Peters who uh, had moved back over to another station, KEYN, and he said, "You know, I think we have an opening here in midday. This will be a full time job, and and I will just be very very transparent. That full time job they offered." When I was 19, they said, this pays $13,000 a year. You're going to make a lot of money. And, and $13,000 a year when I was 19 was nothing then. And I don't even remember why um, I took it other than the fact that it was a full-time opportunity. And so it was, um, you know, it was a move to, to work full-time. Um, I was there for a couple of years, and I happened to see a, a fax come in fax machines. Another, another thing that's changed in our life. Happened to see a fax come in and uh, some new owners had bought the radio station and the fax said, we've just completed the uh, agreement with such and such company to change the format to oldies, which was like 50s and 60s music. And if you're 19 years old, that music is so archaic and old. I mean, there's no way in the world I could relate to it. And in my mind, I thought, there's no way I can last here because I just saw some, some information about them changing from a very popular, you know, teenage radio station to all of a sudden this old music. So at the same time, there was a job that came open in Hutchinson, Kansas, which was a, a morning show and was there for a while and, and then eventually came back to, to Wichita when, um, when KZSN had an opening for for a midday shift doing doing country music and uh i don't know when you're when you're in your early 20s and and you know you want to be somewhat you want to be somewhat relatable around your friends at that time it wasn't country music where you wanted to be involved in but at the same time it was the time when country music was exploding so it was an exciting time to be there but i can tell you as far as the longevity of making it through that a lot of it had to do with the fact of of trying to fly under the radar. And I say that by, if anybody asks you to do anything above and beyond, I always tried to do it within reason, do the extra, um, where they noticed that you worked hard and did more than just what you were paid for. And at the same time, you didn't ask for outlandish things like more money than you. I mean, maybe you could have, maybe any of us could have been paid more money than, than we were, but it was one of those things where in my mind, it was all about, this is all about growing and getting experience, which is far more important than, than what you earn. And, and I think that's how I survived through those times. And you almost have to be a chameleon because you're going to work with a lot of different people. Uh, some people that you just do not like and you cannot stand to be around, but you have to find a way to somehow work with them or work with them long enough until they work their way out of the place you're at. And you'll also learn more from those people than maybe sometimes the mentors that you that you have. But you'll also be surrounded by people uh, like I was that you would just take little 
little things, little bits of information from them, watching them on the air, uh, watching the way they treated others, watching the way they talked to listeners, and, and saying, you know, I, I want to be like that, or I want to do that. And, and you take little pieces of that, and, and that sort of contributes to the longevity. But that, that took me to about 2004 when, um, when I got a call from uh, a guy named Dale Carter uh, in, in Kansas City at KFKF. And, and I had sort of known Dale through the country music industry uh, as, a, as a fellow radio person. And Dale said to me, he said, um, you know, we've got a job open, I think, here. And I said, you do? And he said, well, no, but I'm actually going to make a change here. And, and maybe you'd want to take this job. And and um, he said, there's a problem, though. You're, you're going to make considerably less than what you made in Wichita. But again, it was about sacrifice and about growing, moving into a bigger market, a radio market like Kansas City, meant taking a little bit of a sacrifice and taking a cut to go there um, so you could learn about uh, around people that were more successful and had more experience. And so um, I accepted that in January of 2004 and left and, and stayed there for seven years before, before doing this. All along, you still had this desire to, or you, were, you had a great interest in meteorology and, and storm tracking and weather. How were you able to kind of foster that uh, or I guess continue to pursue that interest while you were doing your you know full-time job and then at what point you had mentioned this earlier because of some of the changes in the radio industry you you went back but how were you over that course of time able to continue to fuel the desire to become a meteorologist or how did that all kind of transpire well it you know, it was it was all about having an interest in weather and an interest in 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 radio and 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 I always wanted to find a way to marry those two. In um, in early 1992, um, you know, I was in my early 20s and I decided that what I was going to do was uh, put together a weather service um, for radio stations to 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 provide forecasts and severe weather coverage because they didn't have the personalities or the people to to do it. Um, I had not gone to school by that time, and I will tell you that that this is a that that was a true lesson in in making mistakes, um, making enough mistakes to basically learn your way into the right direction to go. And and anybody that will tell you that's had any amount of success at all, um, that they've that oftentimes you don't see the battles and the frustrations and the anguish that they went through by making mistakes. Starting that business, I did everything I could the wrong way, spent too much money. We didn't have the, the right technology. Um, we didn't have, I mean, ways to fluently send MP3s or WAV files on the internet. We were still using fax, long distance phone calls charged ridiculous amounts of money, 30, 40 cents a minute. Everything that could go wrong went wrong. And, and, and I lost a lot of uh, money that I didn't have. I mean, I literally had to wind up paying off credit card debt that was just ridiculous that I had done. And, and, and I say that now because it made me terrified to ever want to try and do an entrepreneurship again. Fast forward to 2004, and I had, um, I had met uh, a new friend who, um, he and his girlfriend lived in Kansas City. He was going to chiropractic school. Um, he drove through a uh, uh, we, we were we were at I was at uh, KFKF in Kansas City. We were doing a um, an event that was uh, I think we were doing 94 cent gas, which you know in 2004 was like wow this is a bargain. Now it's not so far off from from being closer to realistic. But we anyway we we uh, we were doing this 94 cent gas. He drove through the line and he said, Dan, I used to listen to you in Wichita. I'm up here. Um, just wanted to say hi going to get my gas and move on. And ironically, he emailed me back later. And it was weird. We struck up a friendship. And he said, you know, I think that 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 you should start up a business doing weather on radio, because I heard you do some coverage on the radio. And I said, I'll never start a business again. And I'll never forget him. He said, um, you know, why, <clears throat> why are you quitting before you even began? Um, you know, that mistake will help you learn to do it right. And and he was very persistent in, in, 
as being a friend. And, and like I say, he was a guy that had never even worked in the business, but he was very persistent into saying, you know, just because you made that mistake, lost money, don't ever be afraid to try doing this again. And so I just saw so many changes going on within the radio business. And anybody that's watching now, you may say to yourself, you know, I don't listen to the radio like I used to. I listen to podcasts or Spotify or, or um, you, know, I'm, you know, I'm online and you communicate differently than you used to. I felt like that day was coming and I had to get out of the day-to-day -day reliance on just being a disc jockey. And so that's where I thought, you know what, we're going to start up a, a feature doing um, information on the radio. It was just two minutes a day and it was called the Storm Report. And it was about doing, uh, it, it was about, here's the bad weather that happened in the country the night before. Here's the, the bad weather that's going to happen today. It was just a short form radio feature. And then from that, it was um, it, it got it started on 33 stations, and then it manifested into doing forecast on the radio, and then it manifested into severe weather coverage. And and what's interesting is um, a lot of people today will say, I don't know why that works because today I have an app and I can get the weather on an app. But what we found is is even though you can get a weather on an app. Um, research shows that everybody still wants that human connection to another human telling them, hey, there's a tornado coming and you're going to be okay or you're not going to be okay. Um, and, and an app can't relate to you in a human form. And so there is still somewhat of a need to, to provide this service. So, so that's sort of how that happened. And that's kind of where we are today with it. What were the biggest lessons you learned from your first experience that you took into that second experience? So you avoided, you learned from your mistakes, obviously. What were some of the biggest lessons you learned? The biggest lesson that I learned was business is a simple game of math. And uh, what I tried to do was take out loans um, with no idea how or if I could pay them off. And uh, it turned into probably a five or six year um, experience of, wow, I, you know, uh, I'm going to have to spend a long time, you know, paying this all off. And, and it did happen. Um, but I think when I started the second business, the, the thought was, uh, I'm going to start this organically with absolutely no money, not a dime. We're going to do all the work from scratch. We're going to work for free until we find a way for this to make money and not spend any money we don't need to spend other than hosting costs and internet costs. That was all we spent in the beginning um, because in my, in my mind, there's a lot of ways that you can start a business today if you have the passion to stick with it. Or as some people say, you're too stupid to know when to quit. Um, and and that, that would be the case here. Um, it, it, it literally was the difference from the first time was borrowing money I didn't have with no plan on how to pay it back. And the second was not spending a dime, but working just tirelessly for the first dollar or two to come in. And that was 2005 when that started, the second business. And I think you said you started with around 33 stations and mm -hmm. now you're over 300. Mm -hmm. So obviously, uh, it's it's been successful what you've put together. Can you tell us a little bit about? Are you all are, are all three hundred plus stations in the continental U.S. or the the forty eight states, or or are you primarily in a region of the country? You, you mentioned uh, at the beginning you had quite a bit of geographic diversity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, well, most of them are, I mean, there are some states that we don't cover at all. And, you know, there are states like, um, like Idaho or um, Oregon. And, um, you know, we don't actually, I take that back. We do have a station in Oregon now that I think about it. But um, most of the radio stations are here in the middle part of the country or the deep south where the weather is far more active. And it has a major impact on everyone's life. We do have stations in Alaska, in Kenai, Alaska, mm -hmm. where where fishing is is a big deal in the summer, <clears throat> and um, and uh, in fact we have a station I know a couple of stations in Page, Arizona, along Lake Powell. If anybody's familiar with that, it's a huge tourist industry. But 
what we um, what we're experiencing now is all these these radio stations we work with are going through like everything else they're going through a tremendous amount of uncertainty because um, you may or may not know radio stations are solely um, um, you know on FM radio or or even some AM listening which is not what it used to be um, are supported by advertisers and many of the advertisers have said I don't have the money to support you going through this pandemic. So they're going through some real challenges right now too. But, uh, but yeah, we do have stations all across, all across the country. I would say the most of them are in Kansas and Missouri. When you started, I assume you were doing most of, if not all of the on air, you, you said you had the two minute kind of two yes. minute segments as you've gotten bigger as a company, are you, how are you splitting your time between the business end of it and the, the, the talent? Because you're not only doing the on air, you're, uh, do you, do you forecast also? I mean, I know you provide forecasts, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. how, how much do you rely on the national weather service? How, how, what's that process look like? And how are you spending your time as the co-founder president of the company, but also on air talent? Great question. Um, I, uh, it, it's tough. I get up about four o'clock every morning, Monday through Friday, and um, start uh, with doing an agriculture my... forecast for, um, uh, let's see, mainly the Topeka and, and state of Kansas area. And then we'll wind up um, working till about 6.30 in the morning. And then from 6.30 or so, We'll take a break, come back and work at 8.30 in the morning again, and then um, wind up probably doing about, I would say two hours of work until close to 10.30. And the rest of the day is spent on customer service, talking to our radio stations, working with them and, and finding out if they have, have any needs. And then um, from there, we'll wind up possibly getting a phone call maybe about Oh gosh, a radio station has a as a download issue. Maybe they can't, for whatever reason, they can't get the the forecast into their system, and they'll call and say, "Hey, we need to look through this from a technical aspect." So, so yeah, I will do the forecasting part. I'll do um, the recording of itself. I also have um, some other colleagues. One who works in Columbus, Ohio. She works there. Another one in Fort Myers, Florida. Another one in Denver. And then there are a couple of more in Wichita and one in Milwaukee. And, and all of us together record into the same system and then send these, these out to radio stations. But as far as what the day is, you know, uh, for a Friday, my day will kind of wind down here in a couple of hours. But there's always, when you have 300 stations, and, and we're grateful for that, there's always some email or call that's going to come in somebody having a question or wanting something and you just have to be there to provide them good customer service. Great. I, I know we have a couple of questions. Yeah. Uh, John, who is one of our students, is uh, had a question. John, I'm going to unmute you or try to for some reason. There we go. John, did yeah. you have a question? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I was wondering what was the hardest part of getting the stations up and running? Like, uh, was it uh, trying to get everybody to communicate or was it a electric difficulty like the Wi-Fi or what's, what was the hardest part in the whole uh, company of getting it up and running? Um, as, far, as far as getting the radio stations to agree to, to, to work with us and, and run our forecast, is that kind of a, what you were asking? Yes, sir, it was. Oh, okay. So, so yeah, I mean, gosh, that's another facet of this I didn't really even think to talk about is, is um, it, starts, it starts as doing sales, you know, oh, and, and uh, I have, um, I, I had a, my dad's cousin worked in radio sales and uh, he passed away a few years ago, but I remember him telling me, do you, or asking, do you like sales? And I said, oh, I hate sales. I don't want to ask anybody for anything. I just want to do things for people. And he said, you're not going to survive if you don't know how to sell. And I said, but I, I can't, I can't be pushy. And he said, you don't have to be pushy. You just share your idea of what you think is going to be a problem solving solution. 
and then hopefully people will um, listen to your idea. They may not want it, they might. And so I started telling other stations about what we were doing. Um, there were already other companies doing what we were doing, but I tried to create a differentiation and and being more personable and things like that. And so we uh, we got people to believe in us and 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 work with us where we started sending them the audio for forecast and they ran it on their radio stations. And you have to think about, first of all, there has to be a tremendous amount of trust that they put in you for you to take over their radio station and, and import an audio file of their forecast because they're trusting you to, to, to get it right and they're trusting you to not make a mistake and say anything you shouldn't say. Um, but then the technical aspect becomes, how do we get that audio file from where we are to you, and it goes through a number of different um, programs to get there, and and so that that's how it works. But but that would be the thing. There's I think it's it's all about developing a relationship with these people where they believe in your service and what you're providing, and um, then of course you have to negotiate what you're going to get paid or how you're going to get paid, and um, and then then they have to agree to that too. So it, it's it's a process. It really is. Thanks for the, the question, John. Emily is actually, she's a former student and she's uh -huh. one of our career specialists and she had a question. Emily, are you there? Yeah, I am. Um, thank you. Um, so I have a few students who wanna start their own business. Mm -hmm. um, so my question is uh, what advice uh, can you share with them that you would have liked to know before starting your business that can be helpful for them? Oh, th yeah. Thanks, Emily. I appreciate the question. Um, oof, boy, what advice. Uh, every, every business is different. Um, some businesses will require you to make some kind of an investment in different things. And, and I would say there's nothing better than to just getting out a sheet of paper and writing down on the sheet of paper what you absolutely need to, to make the business work what you absolutely need to, um, and, and when I say make make it work, if there are assets, let's say you're starting a t-shirt printing business, well, you know that you're going to need some form of equipment to do that. You have to write down that equipment, what it's going to cost you, and then you have to somehow estimate what you think it's going to make you and realize that, 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 that what you're buying is an asset that's an investment in your future. And, and Every business is going to be different. In our case, I just had to have a computer, a microphone. I had to have, um, you know, the audio equipment to be able to pull this off, and then the internet to be able to send audio files to do it. And if, um, you know, and that, that didn't cost a whole lot of money. But everything is different. I would just say knowing what you have to put into it, knowing, you know, what you have the potential to make, and that's so important because. If you run out and spend $20,000 on something and you have no idea how in the world you're ever gonna make that back, um, that, that's the biggest pitfall that you can fall into. So just a, a good old fashioned piece of paper where you can write down the pros, the cons, the, the, the goods, the bads, the, the, the income and the expenses will really make it clear in your head what, what's going to work and I think how long it will take you to, to make it happen. Hi, I'm Terry Newman from Papa John's Pizza. And I'm Dan Holliday from Kissin' 102. Country star Shelly Wright's coming to Wichita to help out Toys for Tots. Shelly and I will live on top of Walmart until 14,000 new toys are donated. Shelly, are you ready for this? Hey, Dan, if it gets as cold in Wichita as it does here in San Diego, we better start collecting early. Folks can drop their toys off starting now at any area location Papa John's. Drop off toys and pick up pizzas at any Papa John's. You've worked with a lot of different people, a lot of celebrities. Uh, so I'm kind of going back to the radio days. Mm -hmm. Who were some of the more interesting guests or artists that you worked with or interviewed? Oof, uh, there, were, there were quite a few. I, I mean, I, I feel so lucky to have gotten to, to work with different artists um, and, and I, I got into, and I'll just, 
I mean, there were some artists on the on the pop side that, um, you know, they were a little bit more difficult to meet than country artists. Country artists are much more accessible than than the pop artists were. But from the country world, um, there are a couple of interesting stories that that come to mind. Uh, first of all, I can think back when, um, and, and for those of you that are familiar with country music. I can remember the time that Toby Keith came to the radio station in Wichita for the first time. And, and he said, um, uh, you know, he introduced himself. He had played in some bars in and around Wichita um, to, to get familiar. But I remember he said, well, I've just signed this deal with Mercury Records. And uh, I want you to hear this new song I just wrote. It's called Should Have Been a Cowboy. I, I don't really know if it's that good or not, but we just want you to listen to it to see what you guys think. And, and then, uh, he played it, and of course, it wound up being a big number one hit and still is played as an oldie for country music today. Um, I remember when Shania Twain came by, and um, she she stopped by, introduced herself. The first album that she put out was nowhere near the level of quality that she put out later in, the, in, the, in her career. And... Um, we listened to it, we heard her sing, and it was not at all what she sounded like with all of her bigger hits. It, and it goes to show you that just because you try something and maybe you fail out, a lot of people don't know that story. Her first album was a complete, you know, nothing. It just did not do anything. And we heard her sing and she walked out the door and we said, Man, she is so nice, but she, it's just a shame she's not gonna go anywhere. But how little did we know that later she would put out another album that was going to wind up selling 10 million copies. So that just goes to show you if you if you try something and it doesn't work, you know, you may come back later and have the right combination at the right time and it explodes. But the most interesting, uh, I, I think the most interesting visit I can remember would be Kenny Chesney at the beginning of his career and um, they brought him into the radio station. He had not had any hits yet at all. He had a guitar with him and I could tell his hands were sweating. And he said, I I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm just kind of nervous. I'm nervous playing this guitar for you. I, I hope you guys like my stuff. And so he, uh, he played and it, it was, it was, um, you could tell he was nervous through the entire playing, playing his first single. And he left and, and the record uh, representative took us to go eat and we, we talked and, and found out he was just a wonderful guy, just a super nice guy. And um, he came back to the station about maybe three months later and introduced another single after his first hit. And uh, you could see he had a little bit more confidence in what he was doing, but he still wasn't quite there with confidence yet. He still was uncertain about himself. My boss and I decided, my boss said, you know what, we need to make a plaque for him. And the plaque needs to read to the next big superstar in country music. Now, keep in mind, we had no clue he was going to be as big as he is today. We didn't think at all. So he came back to Wichita the third time and we gave him that plaque and he said, oh my gosh, this is the nicest thing anybody has ever done for me. I can't believe you guys think I'm gonna be a superstar. We just wanted to tell him that we supported him because he was a nice guy and we hoped he did well. I saw him in 2010 and the first thing he did was walk up and he said, I still have that plaque hanging on my wall. I'll never forget that you guys believed in me when nobody did. So that's the most interesting story. And the biggest thing I would take away is you learn that these people are just like us. They had a dream, they wanted to do something, they failed more times than you'll ever hear about, but somehow they made it, and anybody really can, as long as you've got a path and a, and a plan. That's, that's a really cool story. Uh, we've got some other questions, actually. Um, Emily, her class has a couple extra uh, questions. I'm gonna see if I can unmute Emily. And Emily, if you wanted to ask your questions on behalf of your students. Um, have you ever been in situations where you had announced like a tragic weather situation, like for example, a tornado? And the other question would be, um, 
Did your stations cover Halley's Comet this Monday? Yeah, I'll do the second half of the question first. Um, stations mentioned it, and in some cases, if there was a clear sky, we talked about it briefly in the weather, um, but I don't know that they, they talked about it in detail unless the, the DJs on the stations did. Um, but, but it was briefly mentioned. <clears throat> yes, uh, tragic weather situation. Um, trying to think. Um, I think the most, probably the, the most recent thing I can remember, there was a large tornado that touched down last May, I want to say 29th-ish or so, and it happened in east central Kansas. It skirted the southeast part of Lawrence, and then it headed for Kansas City. And, um, you know, I think back, there, there were some things we covered where there was some loss of life. But this one, I remember vividly because it was headed for um, Bonner Springs, Kansas, and then it was headed for, you know, I think it was, was at Linwood, I believe it did a lot of damage in, in the northeast part of the state. But there was this, this tornado was very large and it was going right toward the Kansas City metropolitan area. And when these events are happening, we're on a closed circuit chat with the National Weather Service. And the guy in charge said, I cannot beg you enough to plead for the people of Kansas City to get in your shelter because this will come right into downtown if it stays on course. And I just remember getting chills then. And then you, you read that all the time while you're on the air and you're, you're doing the play-by-play -play on the radio of this tornado. You can see a video of it. You can see what they're writing. And you're trying to paint a picture for people that are driving home what's happening. And um, it, in terms of, it, you know, thankfully it didn't go through downtown Kansas City, but in my mind, all I could envision was, you know, people are going to be trying to get out of these large high-rise buildings and they're not going to make it. And, and it was coming right for them. And, and so I, I, just, um, I just can recall that that was, that was one of those times that it was incredibly scary. And it was really important that we use that human touch of being able to convey how important it was to move to a safe place. But that, that's, that's what resonates, I think, the most. Seth is one of our students, and he had a question, or maybe two. Seth, are you there? Yes. What did you want to ask Mr. Um, Holiday? I wanted to ask, what radio station is he in? Did you hear that, Dan? Yes, I did. Um, I would, well, I would ask, there's, there's, uh, there's several, there's quite a few radio stations that that were on, and it would be, um, gosh, there's probably too numerous to mention. Um, what what area do you live in, Seth? El Dorado, Kansas. In El Dorado. Did you say El Dorado? Yeah. Hey, hey hometown boy. Awesome. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, that's where I was born, Susan B. Allen Memorial Hospital. So, yeah, in in um, I, in in um, so we're on several that you can pick up in El Dorado. We're on 105.3 The Buzz. We're on Power 93.5, if you've heard of those stations. And we're on um, KNSS, the news talk station in Wichita as well. So that would be, I, I think those cover El Dorado pretty well. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Seth, for your question. And Marlisha is one of our regional directors. She also had a question, although I can't unmute you for some reason, Marlisha. <laughs> There you go. I'm unmuted. Hello. I would like hi. to hi. I would like to know what other career opportunities are ava available in radio, maybe like producers, audio tech, um, for young people who are thinking about going into the radio business. Well, I will tell you that um, radio is going through what everything else is going through right now with the um, the COVID nineteen pandemic. They're going through massive layoffs and. There are people that I've known that have been in the business for all their life, you know, 20, 30 years that are no longer working there. And, and in many cases, they're reduced to a skeleton crew. But what radio is in need of the most is there a lot of people that work in the radio side are not really sure how to marry the product with digital, with, with social media, with um, podcasting. 
Um, anybody who can learn a lot about social media and podcasting um, and on-demand audio and, and anything like that is a huge benefit. So if you want to start in the business and, and you know a lot about the digital side, like how to, how to do a good job on social media, how to, how to really convey to an audience and, and do it in an effective way, and then if you know and learn and study about podcasting, that's good. I would also say from the technical side, anybody that wants to go to broadcast engineering school, and forgive me, I'm not exactly sure where you would do that. There's a number of places, I think. But in, but in radio, um, a broadcast engineer or a guy who fixes towers and transmitters and equipment and computers is the most valuable person and has the most job security because every radio station has got to have one. They aren't losing their job because things have always got to be uh, fixed and upgraded and repaired. So if you can somehow go to school or get some kind of a, a learning experience and understanding how broadcast audio works and, and IT, um, your, your position is invaluable right now. Okay, well, as we wrap up, I, I've got a couple other questions, but I know Dee Dee, one of our career specialists in Newton, has some students, and I believe they had a question. Dee Dee, are you there? I am. Are you, uh, so they want to know if you know Blake Smith. Blake Smith, I, I know the name, but I don't know him personally. Okay, he was a... Uh, Forecaster for Cake Weather. Yes, yes. And he's now one of our assistant principals. Oh, really? Yes. Yeah, so they, uh, yes. he, he is. Um, his communication skills are, are unparalleled. I have to say, oh. probably from his background. Um, but yeah, he, uh, they love him. He communicates well, and he does the weather for them every once in a while on the morning announcements. So. That's awesome. Yeah, I knew I, I, I was going to say I thought that he had done television weather and I've lived in Kansas City for quite some time. So I don't get to watch the local stations right. back home. But but yeah, I knew the name. And uh, so, yeah, well, please tell him hello. And, and, and I'm so glad that that his career is working out great and everybody loves what he does. Well, they will be excited to tell him that they got um, they're kind of listening to you because I'm I'm like the liaison <laughs> here. But uh, they also love to hear the one-on-one -on -one stories, like um, you know the one person who helped you, who gave you that uh, gave you that boost. They really enjoyed hearing that story. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Well, Dan, we we really appreciate the time you've spent with us, and and maybe sometime in the future, as things get back to in-person learning, we we can have classes, uh, full classes, maybe uh, connect with you in some way. Uh, certainly we have programs in the Kansas City area, so maybe that's something we, we could look forward to. Yes. Um, one of, I guess I have two kind of uh, concluding questions. One of the interview questions we ask people are what was your most embarrassing moment? I'm wondering if you would be willing to share one of your most embarrassing moments. <laughs> oh boy, you know I'm I I've been I've been very fortunate to um, to to not have many, but one of them that sticks out was um, was I remember, and, and I and I can't recall exactly what the lyrics were, but I was talking about. I was talking about something about a song. I remember talking, I believe what it was, is it, it was there was a lady who had called and wanted to hear uh, a request for her husband because her husband was, um, I want to say he was, they were celebrating something together. And for whatever reason, I chose the wrong song to play. And the song was about a husband dying. And, and it was, it was all about that. And I, and, and I remember the phone rang afterwards and the listeners were saying, Dan, how could you play that? That's horrible what you just played. And I said, I didn't even look at the lyrics. I played the wrong song. And, and I remember for days, I was just, I felt gut punched about what were you thinking, not paying attention to that. But it was, yeah, it was about some guy dying a horrible death instead of celebrating life. So that was it. 
Uh, sorry, I had to mute that one. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. Uh, so the, the, the last one is, is easier. You've worked a lot of different formats, a lot of different kinds of music. You alluded to this a little bit earlier when you were 19, that country wasn't maybe the, the best type of music for someone your age, but what is your favorite kind of music? Um, it, and that's hard to say um, because um, I, I love, this is, this is interesting, I love R, you know, older school R&B music, um, especially 80s R&B music, which is unusual for a, a kid that grew up on a farm in, in, in eastern Butler County, you know, to, to like that. But for whatever reason, there's a, any artist that, that has a really soulful sound that, uh, that you, um, and, and I've always said there's a magic in singers when they're able to uh, sing a lyric or sing a song and make it so powerful that you, you feel it, you know, you feel the song. There are some singers that just sing, others that, that, that just have this connection. And, um, and I'll just tell you, there's, there's an r and it's funny because I've gone through uh, some of the people I really loved, um, you know, from the 80s, Ray Parker Jr. There's even a band called Champagne that had some really soulful music in the 80s. And I went on Facebook and I said, I want to find out if the lead singer is still alive and if he's still performing. And I sent him a friend request and he accepted it back and I got all excited and I was like, nobody's going to know who Champagne is, but you know, I love their music. So I think we all have that. Every one of us have like a little niche of music we like, but I'm probably like you and everybody else. Um, all of us have different songs and all genres that we, we love or that we, we take away from. So there is some country uh, music that is, that is really well done and, and I respect and, and then there's there's stuff in pop music today that's really cool and so uh, i mean uh, hopefully that answers the question but that does. somewhat that's the core but then it's all over the board too yeah yeah and maybe depending on your mood that day so right 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 well dan holiday with the storm report we really appreciate your joining us on coffee with chuck we've learned a lot a lot of great nuggets of wisdom Thanks, and, and hopefully we'll uh, catch up with you again sometime. Thank you very much. I really appreciate you having me, and uh, thanks to everybody. I see a lot of messages are coming in saying thank you, and, and I just, I really appreciate it. This is so much fun to do. Great. Well, have a wonderful weekend. Hopefully, well, I don't know. I mean, I guess it keeps you busy, but hopefully there's no <laughs> horrible weather out there. <laughs> no, uh, no, no, it's quiet this weekend almost everywhere, so that's awesome to say in May. Excellent. All right. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, everyone.